Hello. So it is week one. It is Tuesday. So your second class of the week. I mean, actually, truthfully, I'm recording this on Monday, but it's Tuesday and uh, we are going to start our first day of content. Um, just a couple of quick reminders before we get into that. Your journal and discussions are due uh, tonight. So uh, Tuesday night by midnight Eastern time. And that's kind of it for the moment. Um, we'll keep you posted as things continue to come up. Um, do be checking those daily as well as um, weekly checklists that I'm providing. Um, I'm thinking that they're sort of training wheels for right now. We may or may not continue those as the term goes on. Um, but trying to keep everybody on the same page as I know, you know, things are pretty confusing in these first few uh, days and, and probably even these first couple of weeks, truthfully. So um, be in touch if there's anything that I can do to help. Um, if things are, you know, just if you're like, Miss Finney, this is just not working, um, you know, let me know and we will um, definitely try to figure out solutions that are working for everyone. So we are going to sort of start off by talking about plants. So I had you read um, some ec that excerpt from Braden Sweetgrass yesterday, and um, I'm hoping that you enjoyed that. I've been really into that book um, all break. I think it's just absolutely lovely. Um, Dr. Wal Kimmerer is an indigenous botanist, and um, her voice just speaks through so beautifully in her um, reverence for nature, and it's just really great. Um, but so the topic of this term is going to be plants, plant biology, sustainability, and um, social issues um, related to those. So I think that kind of begs the question, like, why plants? Like, why do we study them? We are human beings. Um, we do not look like plants. We eat plants. Um, but why do we need to understand them? And I guess the answer is really that we are, um, we are, intrinsically connected in many ways, but if we think scientifically, exclusively, um, we are connected uh, through the food chain in a really uh, direct way. So plants are what we call producers, and we call them this because they create their own food source, they create and utilize their own food source. And so if we look at this, this is sort of a diagram of the like food chain, we would think of it. And so what we're looking at is we show energy from the sun coming in and then going to the producers. And then as we look at each level of this pyramid, each level eats the organisms below it. So the primary consumers eat the primary producers, the secondary consumers eat the primary consumers, and so on, until we get up to apex predators. Now, there's waste products, you know, coming out of each side. And so what happens is this energy goes into the sun, goes into the producers, and then that energy sort of travels up the food chain. But as we ascend each level, as we ascend to each level, there is energy lost. In fact, it's like 90% of energy is lost through the ascension of another trophic level. So we would say that if you wanted to be like really energetically favorable, you want to conserve as much energy as possible, you want to eat in as low of a trophic level as possible. So this is um, related to why uh, vegetarian and vegan diets are thought to be good for the environment, um, but we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more later on. But so we've got this loss of heat energy, this waste of heat energy up to 90% coming out on one side. And then we have other uh, waste products. So biotic waste. So biotic would be like living. Um, the opposite to that would be abiotic. So non-living, things like rocks. Um, biotic waste would be um, waste products from something that is currently or was alive. So things that are made up of organic molecules, um, things that are made up of biomolecules. These all get uh, recycled by organisms that we call decomposers. So these are our bacteria, these are our fungi, these are things that live in the soil that break those um, biotic debris, essentially those biotic waste products back down to the molecules from which they're made. 
And so it all starts at the very bottom with, with plants. None of this would be possible because no other organism is capable of transferring that initial energy from the sun and into something that is usable for itself. It's very cool. And so because they're able to do that, we call these organisms autotrophs. And so if we break this word down, auto means like self. Um, troph is a suffix that means like to feed or food. Um, and so we talked about like trophic levels here. So we'll, we're going to come back to this specific diagram a little bit later. Um, but like a trophic level is like a food level. It's like a level in the food chain. So an autotroph would be a self-feeder. And again, we call them that because they are capable of producing their own food. Um, they do this through um, the metabolic conversion of photo energy. So when I say photo energy, that prefix photo means light. And so we're saying that they take light from the sun. They're able to use their um, metabolic processes, the chemical reactions within their body to convert that sunlight energy into, into usable chemical energy in the form of glucose, which can be stored. And then subsequently, the glucose will get uh, transformed into ATP, which is the usable energy of a eukaryotic cell. Now, all of this is in opposition to um, another feeding style that we'd call heterotroph. And so a heterotroph would be like us. So hetero, um, the prefix meaning different, troph again meaning to feed. So these are different feeders. So a heterotroph is an organism that because it cannot photosynthesize itself, it's not capable. It'd be kind of cool if I could, I would really like that. Um, but a heterotroph, cannot photosynthesize and therefore must consume other organisms in order to power the chemical reactions that keep that living system going. So in our case, these would be like our DNA replication, this would be mitosis, this would be cell differentiation, um, this would be digestion, this would be all sorts of things that are happening in the human body. And so to understand the process by which producers or plants are producing their energy sources to look at photosynthesis, um, we kind of need to understand the photo part of that. We need to understand light. And so um, folks who are um, coming from my class last term, may remember, and perhaps you've covered this in another class also, um, this might be something that would appear in physics potentially, um, but thinking about light, um, we need to know that light behaves as both a wave and as a particle. And so when I say it behaves as a wave, we can actually measure light and determine roughly how much energy exists within a um, within a like chunk of light, I suppose. And so the general rule is we would say a shorter wave, a shorter wavelength would equal a higher energy wave versus a longer wavelength would equal a lesser energy wave. And so a wavelength refers to the distance between the between two crests of a wave. So we can again measure light this way. And so we would say this is like your signs in math, right? And so you would say that the distance between two crests is the length of the wave with the trough in between. The trough is that little valley in between. And so there's a really, really wide range of light. And so on either end, you've got you know, some extremes, right? Like on the really extreme end of the high energy, we would say that these are like gamma rays. This is like the stuff that's in space. It will just destroy you with radiation if you go out into space unprotected. Um, this, is part, this is one of the things that the Earth's atmosphere protects us from. So we don't get gamma rays. Um, those are very, very high energy. They would hurt us very much. We go a little further down and we start seeing things like x-rays and, oh, that looks familiar. We can see our bones with that and that's very useful for medicine. 
um, we go a little bit further down and we have UV rays. So UV, ultraviolet, is a form of radiation. So again, if you're returning to my class, you've heard me get on this soapbox before, but this is why you must wear sunscreen um, irrespective of your baseline skin tone at UV rays from the sun are radiation. And when you get a sunburn, that's not a heat burn. That's not like you put your hand on something too hot. That's a radiation burn, you know, and you can get really sick and um, increases your risk of skin cancer. And, you know, it's not great. So wear sunscreen, regardless of your baseline skin tone, please, please, please. Um, we go a little further down, and so again, we're moving into lower energy, so a UV ray would be less energy than, say, a gamma ray, um, so a longer wavelength. And so if we go further down from UV, we start to get in what we call the visible light spectrum. So this is all the light that we can see. These are all the colors that we know to exist. This is all the light that our eyes are physically capable of seeing. So you'll see that they're, you know, they're fairly uh, long wavelengths, I guess, as wavelengths go. And within them, they have a range too. And so we would say that, uh, a, that in the visible light spectrum, light that is purple, for example, would be higher energy than light that is red. Red would be lower energy because it has a longer wavelength. There is a wider distance between crests of that wavelength. And so as we go further down, we start to see other things that look familiar, right? Like there's infrared that is outside of the visible light spectrum. There's radio waves, um, microwaves are down here somewhere too. Um, so there are other, you know, forms of, of this like light and radiation that we can, um, that we can account for. And so I said that the visible light spectrum accounts for all of the colors that we know to exist and all the colors that our light that our eyes are capable of responding to. And so the way that that's possible is through pigment molecules. And so a pigment molecule is a usually a, a fairly large um, molecule that exists within certain cells and exists in all sorts of stuff. Um, the, there can be synthetic ones too that we would find um, in plastics and other materials that we see, stones and all kinds of stuff. Anything that you see with a color has pigment molecules in it of some kind. And so when I said uh, that light behaves as both a wave and a particle, those particles we call photons. So these are like individual um, packets of light. These are like little high energy, like balls of light energy that when they reach a pigment, when they contact a pigment, they are either absorbed or they are reflected back. And so you can imagine that when we have light sh uh, shown at something, not 100% of it is going to be absorbed, right? And so what happens here is the pigment will absorb a particular you know, wavelength of light. So perhaps it um, absorbs red light. And so then you would say to yourself, or so then you would, you know, you would think about this light that is hitting the object. And so if red is being absorbed, then within that group of uh, light that is being shown at this object, the opposite would be reflected back. And so to find the opposite, you actually use like, um, you could use like the color wheel that you see in art class. The opposite uh, complementary color is what will be reflected back. So the pigment was capable of absorbing uh, red pigments. And so it reflects green back at you. Now human eyes actually respond and function by the amount of light that we receive. So our eyes work by being able to process and receive light signaling. It wouldn't work otherwise. This is why we can't see in the dark. And so 
that when that unabsorbed light is reflected back, this is the color that we see. So this is why some leaves appear green to us. And then as the seasons change, different pigment molecules become more prominent within the leaves. And so different light wavelengths are reflected back at us to reflect the differences in pigment within the leaves. So in in plants, you know, we have a lot of different pigments that we care about. You know, there's chlorophylls, which are responsible for us perceiving the green color. Um, there's also carotenes, which give us, um, which allow our eyes to see the yellow color. Um, anthocyanins, flavonoids, there's all kinds of things. Um, but these are beneficial because they allow the plant to absorb a wide range of light from the spectrum. Um, in humans, of course, the pigment that we've spoken about the most is melanin. This is one of the pigments responsible for determining skin tone. And then um, there's also carotenes and hemoglobin that are pigment molecules that, that we care about that are relevant to humans. Okay, so we talked about light. So before we can get into the mechanisms of the, of the photosynthetic process, maybe let's just quickly refresh ourselves on what's in a plant cell. It's maybe been a little while since we thought about this. So if we look at a plant cell, I mean, in many ways, it's just like any other eukaryotic cell. Um, we've got a plasma membrane, which is gonna have that phospholipid bilayer that we remember from cell biology in the fall. We are going to have the cytoplasm. So this is the goo that everything is suspended in. Our Golgi apparatus, our ribosomes for protein production our mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, the nucleus, the DNA is living in there. Um, in plant cells, we also have a vacuole, which is kind of, I like to think of as like the trash can of the cell. Um, so it's mostly going to be holding water, but it also will hold uh, relevant molecules. Um, it may hold pigments, it may hold um, toxins, it may hold active molecules. So in like a tobacco plant, the nicotine molecules would actually be held in the vacuole. In a coffee plant, um, some of the, there would be caffeine held in the uh, leaves of the vacuole, which is pretty neat. And so in plant cells, we've also got a cell wall, which keeps the, um, which keeps everything sort of rigid and stable, gives it its structure. And we most importantly have the chloroplast. So this is the one that we really, really care about. Chloroplasts are neat. Um, they're kind of like mito mitochondria, but not. Like they make their food and then they send it to the mitochondria to eat. They're kind of like the chefs of the cell, I guess. Um, if the mitochondria is like the powerhouse, then I guess maybe, I don't know, the chloroplast is like the workers that power the powerhouse. Um, I don't know if that analogy really works, but I don't know, we'll see. Um, but chloroplasts are cool. So we would only find these in organisms that are capable of photosynthesis. So either uh, plants or there are bacterial organisms or prokaryotes um, that we'd call um, cyanobacteria that are really neat. They are prokaryotes that are actually capable of photosynthesizing because they have chloroplasts. And so within the chloroplast, I mean, we'll see some stuff that looks pretty familiar. So the, there's, you know, two membranes. These are, again, phospholipid bilayers, just like what we're used to seeing. Um, we have the stroma, which is a lot like cytoplasm, but it's sort of, um, it's like gooier, I guess, is the best way I can think of it. It's uh, pretty jelly-like. It's really thick. It's kind of gross, um, but it's like cytoplasm. It's uh, this fluid um, for which all of the organelles of the chloroplast are going to float around in. And then this is where it gets a little bit tricky in terms of nomenclature. So if we, so here, here we've got these stacks, right? See these little stacks of coins here. So these are what we call the granum or the grana. So granum singular, grana plural. And so grana are made up of stacks, cylindrical stacks of many what we call thylakoids. So a thylakoid is a, this like short disc and it's like a disc made of membrane. My cat wants to come talk to us about chloroplasts also. So these, these thylakoids are coated in a membrane. So they have a membrane surrounding them. And in this membrane, 
I know. In this membrane, there is chlorophyll. So there is chlorophyll. And chlorophyll, of course, is that pigment that's going to give our plants the green color that we're used to seeing. This is what's going to be involved in photosynthesis. And so as a result, because chlorophyll is in this space, this is the site of photosynthesis. So each, so again, to clarify, each disc here is what we call a thylakoid. A stack of thylakoid make a granum, and then many granum uh, make up grana. And so in the thylakoid membrane is where chlorophyll is contained, therefore it is where photosynthesis occurs. And so we've got two phases of photosynthesis, um, generally speaking. And so we, we break these up into what we call the light dependent and the light independent reactions. And the light independent reactions we would also call the Calvin cycle. And so in general, um, you know, the process of photosynthesis is pretty simple. We have an input of light, an input of water, and an input of carbon dioxide. And then from that whole process, if we like look at the entire thing, this entire thing is photosynthesis. We have an input of light, input of water, input of carbon dioxide. We then have an output of sugar and an output of oxygen. And so the light dependent portion of that, the, uh, the products of that uh, light dependent reaction are going to be um, oxygen for one, and then there, it's also going to produce two molecules um, called NADPH and ATP. Those two molecules are going to get sent in along with carbon dioxide to the Calvin cycle. And when the Calvin cycle is going to do its thing, and then at the end, it's going to produce for the plant sugar as well as um, send back two molecules, NADP plus and phosphate ion, back to um, the component where the light reactions are happening. So this PI here um, stands for phosphate ion. And so before we can talk about the mechanisms here, let's look at uh, just some quick general anatomy. We will go into all of this um, pretty soon, um, but we're going to just look at a couple of important pieces. So I want to tell you about the stomata, um, singular stoma. Um, and the stomata are little pores in the leaf that are responsible for facilitating gas exchange. So these are the guys that are going to allow for that intake of CO2 and that output of oxygen. So the stoma, they open and close um, and they allow the exchange of gas that way through the surface of the leaves. Um, sorry, in case that wasn't clear, this is, a, this is leaf anatomy. Um, the stoma exists in the leaves. Also on the leaves are what we call the cuticle. And so this is present on pretty much every species of leaf. Um, the cuticle is like this, uh, is this waxy like layer made up of lipids and cholesterols, um, which help maintain the homeostasis of the plant by preventing evaporation of water through the leaves so that the plant can be sure that it has enough water to maintain the functions that it needs to have which we're gonna talk about in just a second. So all of this is gonna, you're gonna be feeling really cool and really smart um, pretty soon because I know this looks really scary and I wanted to show it because it looks scary, um, but I promise you that you will uh, know your way through this um, soon enough, um, provided you follow along with this and ask questions if you're confused. But if you want to, understanding this diagram is certainly achievable. And so we're going to start by, we're going to like sort of wrap up today um, by talking about the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis. So the main steps of which are excitation of photosystems by light energy, the production of ATP um, through the electron transport chain, and the reduction of NADP plus and the photolysis of water. So there's a lot of words in there that we may not recognize right now, and that's okay, we'll get there. Um, we're gonna break it down as we go. 
Um, one note I want to look at before we uh, move on into the actual mechanisms is this concept of reduction. So if folks have taken chemistry before, this may sound familiar. Um, there's a pretty famous acronym, OIL RIG, so O-I-L-R-I-G, and so it stands for oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. And so reduction doesn't actually um, have anything to do with a um, reduction in size or a like reducing in, in the way that we would initially expect. Um, reduction actually has to do in chemistry and in biochemistry with a reduction in overall charge of a molecule. And so this is accomplished by um, adding electrons to a positively charged uh, molecule. And so the opposite is also possible. There's a process called oxidation, um, which is when you uh, lose an electron and so you gain a uh, charge overall. But what we care about is reduction right now. So taking a um, positively charged molecule and reducing that overall charge by adding electrons. So remember the rig part, reduction is gain. Reduction is gain of electrons specifically. Okay, so this is a, an overview of what we're gonna be looking at for the light reactions. Um, at least for the first step, I wanted to kind of start by zoomed out and then go in a little bit further. So this would be that first step that we're looking at. So this diagram here is showing the membrane of the thylakoid. So this is the thylakoid membrane. Um, this would be the stroma up here. And inside here would be um, what we call the thylakoid space or like the inside of the thylakoid. And so embedded as transmembrane, um, as transmembrane uh, molecules, we have uh, two main molecules that we call the photosystems. So we have photosystem one over here to the right and then photosystem two over here to the left. A lot of people get confused about this because the first um, photosystem in the chain of events is actually called photosystem two, but it's actually just named that because that's the order that they were discovered in. Um, this P680 and P700 has to do with um, wavelengths that they're capable of accepting. So don't worry about that too much right now. Maybe more on that later or probably not if we don't need to get to it. So just like a broad overview of what's happening in this thylakoid membrane, we have here our photosystem two. So light from the sun, um, reaches uh, this, this circle here, and these circles represent chlorophyll molecules. And so light hits a chlorophyll molecule, and when it does, it excites um, or energizes the electrons of the chlorophyll molecule. And so that excited or energetic electron then begins a chain reaction where it is transferred to the next one, energizes electron there, to the next one, energizes electron there, to the next, to the next, to the next, and so on. Until it reaches this molecule here, this electron, and when this one becomes energized, it gets sort of slingshotted up into this space, which I'll show you in another diagram. I don't love how they showed it in this one, but it gets sort of slingshotted up once it's excited to this space, which we'd call the electron acceptor space. And so more on that with this diagram, which I think is more complex, but shows a little bit more of what we're interested in. So again, the pigment molecules, the chlorophyll um, inside these photosystems, this is our photosystem here, are going to be essentially, they're going to absorb the light. So they're going to receive a photon of light from the sun. And that's going to excite the electrons of the chlorophyll, which is then going to begin a chain reaction of exciting um, electron, or I'm, I'm sorry, exciting uh, chlorophyll electrons all the way down until we reach the center of this um, photosystem. And so once this electron becomes excited, then it gets sent up to the electron acceptor molecule. 
Now, before it does, before it makes that journey up there, this excited electron is temporarily going to be here. So right now, right where my cursor is, we have a chlorophyll molecule that is all jazzed up. It's got energized electrons and just all this energy and it hasn't transferred it over yet. And this is important because this is where water comes in. So we said that water was an important part of this reaction. And it's not just for maintaining um, the structure and rigidity of a, plants, of a plant. And so what happens with the water is water molecules are drawn up into the thylakoid space. So remember, this is the thylakoid space. This is the stroma up here. And so the water comes up and then we have a process called hydrolysis. So hydro meaning water, lysis meaning to break. And so the water molecules will come up and be drawn up to this excited electron. And when they contact that excited electron, the molecule breaks apart. The water molecule breaks apart because of the energy in that chlorophyll. And so when it breaks apart, it sends one of its electrons to the electron acceptor in the photo, in the photo uh, system. And then it's, its oxygen goes one way and gets released as a byproduct. And then the two protons left over, the two H pluses that were part of the water, remember water is made up of two hydrogens, one oxygen, the two hydrogens stay in that thylakoid space for a moment. The oxygen again leaves as a byproduct, the remaining electron gets kicked up to the electron acceptor. That can be a really complex concept. So, and I understand, you know, we, we don't have um, a situation where we can ask questions in real time. So please um, reach out to me and come see me if that is not making sense. Rewind the video, rewatch it a couple of times, and please be in touch if I can explain that um, in another way that will be helpful. So the Electrons have been excited and they have made their way up to the electron acceptor. So once they make their way to the electron acceptor inside photosystem two, again, remember photosystem two is this first transmembrane molecule embedded within the thylakoid membrane. And so that excited electron is going to go to the electron acceptor and it is going to uh, transfer its energy it's going to be transferred, sorry, energetically to this second um, acceptor molecule here. And I'm sorry, my cursor keeps freezing on me. So if there's a little delay, I apologize. So, this, so the, electron, the second electron acceptor molecule here receives the electrons from photosystem two, and then they get sent down along this membrane space heading towards photosystem one. This is what we call, this portion here that I'm sort of circling over, is what we call the electron transport chain because the electrons are being transported along the uh, inner space of the plasma membrane of the thylakoid. And so as the electrons are passing, the, they start to lose energy. And that remember, we just said that energy doesn't really... Um, doesn't really go away, it just gets sort of re recycled and repurposed. So what's happening is as these electrons are losing energy, they are, that energy is being used uh, to power this molecule here. So this is a transmembrane protein that's job it is to pull protons um, from the stroma to the thylakoid space. So from the outside in. And these transmembrane proteins are one way. They only pull from the stroma to the thylakoid space. But the energy of the, um, the energy of the electron transport chain is what allows them to do that. So while the electrons are being transported from photosystem two to photosystem one, the protons are being pulled in from the stroma to the thylakoid space. 
once there has been a sufficient buildup of uh, protons here, of H plus ions, remember there's still uh, water being split over here by photosystem two, and that's causing an accumulation of protons. We're pulling some from the stroma into the thylakoid space, that's causing an accumulation of protons. And so, they're going to start building up eventually to the point where you're going to create a concentration gradient where the concentration of protons is greater inside the thylakoid space than it is on the outside. And so what happens when the concentration of protons reaches this point is what we call chemiosmosis. So it's osmosis, um, just like we've learned of it before. So the movement of um, solvent from a area of high concentration to low concentration, that would be osmosis. Um, except it's, they call it chemiosmosis because it's chemicals, I guess. Um, so all these protons are going to build up, build up, build up, but they eventually have to leave. And when they leave, they're going to move from the area where they're highly concentrated, which is the thylakoid space, to the area where they are not concentrated anymore, which is the stroma. But since this transmembrane protein was a one-way street, the only way they can go is through the ATP synthase. And so ATP synthase is pretty aptly named um, because it is, it, well, it ends in ACE, so we know that anything that ends in ASE is going to be an enzyme, um, which means it is a, a catalyzer for a chemical reaction. And synth, you know, kind of sounds like synthesis, right? ATP um, is ATP. Um, and so it is a molecule, it is an enzyme that synthesizes ATP. So all the protons are going to come from the thylakoid space to the stroma through the ATP synthase. And as the protons are being pumped through the ATP synthase, this top part is like a little turnstile, like, um, like what you see when you, uh, you know, are taking the subway or something, like it's a turnstile like that. And the protons um, being pumped out are what power that. And so every time a proton is pumped through, the turnstile cranks, and this causes the, the joining of a phosphate ion, and a molecule called ADP. So what I didn't tell you is that ATP, its full name is adenosine triphosphate. So adenosine is a molecule that's similar to adenine, like the nucleic acid, um, a little different. Um, adenosine triphosphate, so tri meaning three and then three phosphates. So it's a adenine analog with three phosphate groups attached to it. And so ADP is a form of that less one phosphate. So ADP's full name would be adenosine diphosphate, so di meaning two. And so the turning of the ATP synthase turnstile, this top part here, is the chemical, causes the chemical reaction needed to join a phosphate group to an ADP, making it go from two uh, phosphate groups to three. And so that having that third phosphate group is what makes ATP uh, and really energetic and able to be uh, stored and used for cellular energy. So I think that's where we'll leave off for now. There is a little bit more to it. Um, but we have covered quite a lot um, for now, so I think that is where we will pause and uh, take a break and come back and finish the rest of that process as well as the Calvin cycle on Friday. So please let me know if you have any questions, um, if you need anything. I know things are, you know, a little hinky right now with trying to figure out schedules, but um, do keep me posted and let me know if there's anything I can do. All right, talk to you soon.